to Real Girl Talk. I am your host, Sherry Ricard. I empower women to stand in their purpose, to succeed despite the odds stacked against them, and to live their life knowing they're enough and worthy. Join me each week for powerful messages and interviews that will inspire you to create the life that you want. Now let's go. Welcome back to the show. I am your host, Sherry Ricard, and you're listening to Real Girl Talk Podcast Radio. As promised, I bring you powerful messages and interviews every single week, and today is no exception. I'm chatting with Jackie Siegel, best known for her role in the award-winning documentary feature, Queen of Asa by Magnolia Pictures, which premiered at Sundance Film Festival in 2012, and it continues to be one of the most popular movies on Netflix. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot on the sofa, and stay tuned. Besides being a businesswoman, a model, an actress, she is a devoted wife and mother. However, Jackie, unfortunately, like myself, as you guys know, had to endure the worst call of her life that her 18-year-old daughter had died. And today we're going to talk about her story and her new personal book, profoundly personal book, Victorious Voice, which is basically her pages from her late daughter's journal. Jackie, welcome to the show. Hey, good morning. And thank you so much for inviting me. You know, today, before we dive into Victoria's Voice, I want you to tell us, first of all, where did you get the title Queen? Well, uh, the thing is, um, I've always been in, involved in beauty pageants, and I did win uh, Mrs. Florida, and, and I'm now a producer, so I've been producing beauty pageants, and, and I've produced the Mrs. Florida America and host Mrs. America, Mrs. World at our Westgate Las Vegas resorts. So I've always kind of like had this crown on my head, you know, like I do appearances and stuff. Yeah. And when the, uh, for the documentary, when they were uh, doing the documentary, I mean, building the largest home in America, which is really a palace, but it's also my, I call it a home. They, they thought that um, it made sense to call me the queen. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it does. Like, it, it definitely makes sense to me. You know, I call myself a queen every day, but I definitely don't have the largest home in America or probably even in my city. <laughs> However, I don't, think, I, I don't think you want it. It can be a big headache. Yeah. It, you know what? I saw the film, Jackie, and it seems like it could be just a bit of a headache, but I think it's something I probably could, could endure if in fact it's true that your closet's 5,000 square feet. But in fact, like since we started building the house 18 years ago, I've gotten even like my wardrobe is like more than quadrupled in size or like tenfold. Now I need a larger closet. So we're scrambling for space. Like where are we going to like put my first storage and this and that, you know? So when we get the house, I'm going to do like a lot of uh, like fun charity events, like which I want you to come to. Yeah. And where we'll do like uh, spa days because um, we have like a whole spa. Oh, and um, so we've got awesome. guests and where people can sleep over. And now I've got all these bedrooms. And in 18 years, my, my kids are like they're going off to college. You know, so I'm thinking, what am I going to do with all these bedrooms? So I got to fill them up with my, my friends. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. And you know what? I just had this. I just had this thought. How cool would this be if you and I teamed up and did a mother's retreat for a handful of mothers that have lost their children and give them a retreat. I would absolutely love that. Um, I would love to have a, a retreat like that. In fact, um, I kind of wish like, cause I meet people along my journey, uh, other people, mothers who have lost a child. And um, um, I kind of wish I was compiling their names and, and, and contact information better than I am. But sometimes I just meet people so quick in passing, you know, Right. And I think it'd be wonderful to have, I mean, I think it would help me and to help you and help the other people just knowing that they're not alone and sharing their stories and kind of, it's almost like kind of therapy, like self, like we're, we're treating ourselves like, you know, 
Right. Um, and it is, it I is would, like I, therapy. It definitely is. And we're going to talk about Victoria's voice. And I actually have a copy of Victoria's voice. I have been reading it and my heart is just, I feel so connected to you. Like I do the mothers that I have met all over the country because, you know, um, I was telling you that I have actually, I don't know if that we even talked about this before, but I do a lot of speaking events and I've spoke for compassionate friends, which is a group of um, grieving parents and grieving grandparents. Wow. And I spoke oh. at three or four of their chapters in three different States. And so I've met a lot of women. I talked to a lot of empowerment lunches and conferences and met a lot of women that have lost, um, children, not just children, but have lost their siblings and lost their parents. And they're walking in this grief journey that is people just don't understand unless you actually have been in this journey. But I want you to take us back just a little bit, if you can, and tell us a little bit about Victoria. Just tell us a little bit about her and how it came to pass with this phone call. Victoria, um, she was a girl that um, she, uh, wanted to go to public school. She could have gone to private, but she wanted to go to public. And she wanted to just, she was kind of like a flower girl. Like just, she would make her own tie dye t-shirts and, and give them out at school. And she didn't, she wanted to be barefoot. She didn't care about like designer shoes or, you know, things like that. Right. But the only reason she would wear flip flops because you have to wear shoes to school. And, um, and her dream was to have uh, a sushi restaurant uh, called Ricky Tiki Tavern on Cocoa Beach, where it was going to be like a sandy floor and like they didn't allow shoes and they'd have a check-in thing, um, like with a cubby to put your shoes in when you check in and just to be free and natural. And so, I mean, she really had plans. And then, but at school, you know, she got bullied and... Um, like for her to fit in, she started doing the drugs and stuff with the people at school. And um, then we took her to rehab. Okay. So, you know, the way she got started, she uh, asked, she got Xanax because she oh. said, mom, I have anxiety. And she went to a therapist or, or, or a psychiatrist. I mean, and they prescribed her with Xanax. Um, for a couple of months. And then she never asked to go back to the therapist or the, psychiatrist and so I thought she was fine well come to find out later um she was getting Xanax from school this kid at school had a pill press so she was getting those drugs from school and so Xanax was her drug of choice at this time and but she would experiment with other things like molly and cocaine and right. all that but but she was addicted to the Xanax so one she had thought she had overdosed and she survived. She woke up the next morning. She wasn't home. She was at a, a friend's house. She came to me and she says, mom, I need rehab. She got scared because she realized that she had almost passed away. Right. Um, that's when that night is when she had sent a friend, a text for her, for me to, um, to see if she had passed away, print her diary and put it in uh -huh. In a book. And I and I read that in the book and it just broke my heart. Yeah, on page 12 is the uh, word for word text that um, she's looking down on me from heaven and and that she really wanted me to um, print this book because I'm she felt it would save lives. But let me get back. So so anyways, so we took her to rehab. She was only 18 years old and in rehab well, she went in there because she wanted to come clean. She wanted a new leaf on life life, right? because she felt she was getting a second chance because she survived the overdose. In rehab, she met a 26-year-old man that was a heroin addict, and he was in there by court order. It was either go there and clean up your act or go to jail. So his lawyer had him go there, and he actually had no intentions of quitting heroin when he came out. So she met him, and the day they got out, they, he introduced her to heroin. And a month later, she was dead. Oh, my so, gosh. Yeah, it, it's terrible. So after she passed away, after the funeral, is when her friend forwarded me the text 
to um, of where her diary was and her final wishes, her dying wish was to share her journal because she felt um, on this journey with um, the drug epidemic that, and, and she, she died in the end, um, that it would help save lives and let people know that they're not alone with their struggles and, and with their, whether it's depression or being bullied or just the crazy thoughts that teenagers go through, right. you know, right. um, kind of like how, how you and I, like when you told me you lost your son, it, it gives you a, like a sense of comfort, like a sense of belonging, like, right. like we're this like secret society or private group, you know what I mean? Or right. like a family. And so I think this journal um, will help teenagers to know that they're not alone. And hopefully it opens their eyes and, and gives them strength that drugs are not the answer to the anxiety, things that they're going through, that there's other, um, uh, you know, things to look for like therapy or get, get involved in a sport or a hobby or exercise, you know? Yes. And, but I also think it can help parents because it, my, like, like my husband is a very respectable businessman in, in the world, a billionaire. And this happened right under our noses. We want this to be an eye opener for parents that this, the same thing, it can be happening under their noses behind closed doors, you know? Yeah. So I, I really feel this book is both, both for, for parents and for their, the teenagers. It definitely is Jackie. And, you know, I was kind of going through some of her diary and I started crying and I'd stop and I'd go back to it. And, um, but one thing that I have found in her writings is she goes from periods of being just really a happy go lucky, joyful. I mean, she even drew pictures in her diary of a Halloween costume. So she was very creative and, you know, so she had this creativity in her mind, but then you could tell in parts of her diary where she was influenced. I mean, you could tell the yeah. influence of drugs or alcohol or whatever she was on. You could, you could feel that you could see that in that writing. And it was amazing. It didn't even seem like the same person from some of the well, happier writings. Well, well, I, I think one thing nice about um, uh, this, the Victoria's Voice book, is we put her exact diary in there. Like we you copied did. the exact yeah. pages. So when she's sober, she's got the most beautiful handwriting. Right. And you can tell when, when she's influenced by some sort of a drug that she was on, how her handwriting changes and it gets sloppy. So you can, kind of feel like like maybe some of the emotion and um right. and craziness that was going through her brain when she was influenced on, right. on the drugs and i think that's one thing that's really special i mean i would love it if someday you know how um the helen keller diary is like a famous forever i hope someday that this book will be um famous in in the the world of um the opioid epidemic, you know, saving lives, you know, I really hope it can help. Um, I, 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 I truly believe, I truly believe in my heart that this book is going to help so many people and just taking just pieces from the book, I can see it being used in, in drug rehabs and counseling centers because p those mm -hmm. people that are under the influence of drugs that are trying to get help can read this and see themselves in Victoria and what she was going well, through. Yeah, we've been, we've donated um, thousands of, of the books already, like rehab centers and groups. And um, even like we had a lunch a couple of weeks ago, I was asked to sp uh, speak at one of our sales meetings for Westgate. So many of the parents that came to this meeting were parents that have teenagers and they're worried about their teenagers. And, and we did a book signing and I just donated all the books. You know, we're not in this to make money. In fact, we have a Victoria's Voice Foundation and the proceeds are going to the foundation. And my daughter died three and a half years ago. In June, it'll be four years since she passed away. It's taken me this amount of time to get the courage to share her diary yeah. with the rest of the world. And because, you know, uh, I know like some critics might say, you know, how could a mother um, 
publish a daughter's diary where it's got her most intimate private thoughts. You know, it's something that was just like, it was just so personal. When Victoria died, 150 people were dying a day from the drug epidemic. Right. Now it's 200. So the problem's getting worse. And I realized that, you know, by sitting at home and, and, and staying quiet, I'm not helping saving lives. So I decided to carry the legacy and um, publish the book because it's really going to start a more conversation. And, you know, the- I think it's, I think it's wonderful because you do have that financial blessing to where you're able to do those things, Jackie, and the way that you're using your financial blessing to be able to save other people is just, it just puts you in a whole different light of who you truly are. I mean, I am so connected to you. I forever I'm going to call you one of my spirit sisters because we have such you. a spirit connection that yeah. um, I think until you've lost a child, you don't understand how you feel so much more connected to the spirit world because yeah. you know that your child yeah. is watching over you. And when Mm -hmm. I meet mothers and they'll tell me these stories, I feel this strong connection. And I'm like, we, I call them my spirit sisters because we have that strong connection. And, oh, that would be a good name for our conference, Jackie, or our retreat. Spirit sisters. (laughs) Oh my God. You know, I actually have goosebumps right now. I feel like Victoria is like here. I mean, I, the, the, the hairs on my arm. Just Mine too. Up. Look at that. Look, we can yeah. see each other, guys. Yeah. You guys can't see us, but we can see each other. <laughs> and it's crazy. I have the same exact thing. And I know because our children were so close in age. Um, Bryant was 17 and Victoria was 18. And so we know that, and my son right now is 18. He was only seven at the time. Oh my God. I have a son that's 18 as well. He's, um, we're, um, I've got two kids kids graduating right now and there are parties um graduations next week oh that's awesome so carson finished my my 18 year old oh, is carson and he finished a school yesterday and leah black's son is graduating as well oh yeah, so that's all so cool yes yeah. and we're definitely we're gonna hook up like we said in miami and we're gonna have to bring leah in on um on a lunch with us but i wanted to talk to you too because there's one thing that you're doing that just absolutely is so important. So incredibly important is that, you know, I have a medical background. One thing that we didn't talk about is I am a nurse. Um, even though I don't do bedside nursing, I'm in the medical business profession now and have been for 14 years, as well as my passion work, um, of writing and speaking is one thing that you do is you guys buy Narcan, for the police yep. department, which I can't tell you how many times I've had to give Narcan in the emergency room. So I know exactly what it is. And so tell everybody what is Narcan and why is it so important that the police have that on them? Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up. Um, Narcan, um, it's actually been around since like the 60s and um, no one really knew about it. I mean, people at the hospital and um, nurses like yourself knew about it, but um, it's, um, Narcan is a drug that's um, benign, like we could do it now and it's not going to do anything, you know. But right. um, when, when, you, when someone is on an opioid, whether it's heroin or oxycodone, and, and they're, they could be turning blue in the face and a moment away from death, and you take the Narcan, you can either inject it or it's a nose spray. We, right. we like the nose spray. Right. And it brings the person back to life. It blocks the neurons, um, the brain, neur- um, from, from the drug getting to the brain. And they have about a three-hour window. They get to the hospital and flush out their system and, and, and save their lives. And I guess the simplest way to explain what Narcan is, is everyone knows what anti-venom is. If someone gets a snake bite, anti-venom blocks the poison from the snake. So it's this like a, a comparable analogy. Right. And when Victoria passed away, um, we the we didn't know what to do. I mean, our carpet, like our life was just like felt like the carpet was pulled out from underneath us. Yeah. And we went up to Washington, DC to find out 
about drugs. I mean, we were just like floored and we, we went, met with the DEA and we got ed educated on the different types of drugs and we found out about Narcan. Now there was a bill called the CARA Act, which in this bill, it was um, getting over a billion dollars from the government to provide Narcan to all the police departments and um, colleges across the country. But the bill was sitting on the shelf for over three years. Uh, so my husband and I were instrumental in getting this bill off the shelf and back in front of the Senate and Congress, and we got the bill passed. And, and now um, the, the Narcan is um, implemented um, in, in all the police departments um, across the country. I've been to some college campuses that now have the Narcan. Yes. And, um, and just, well, I had lunch with the sheriff in, in Orlando a couple weeks ago. He told me that so far they've used the Narcan. Unfortunate that they've had to use it, but they used it 2,000 times since we've got this implemented. So oh I know that, um, Victoria, that Victoria's death is um, saving thousands of lives. So, I mean, I find comfort, you know, in, in that, that, that we have been very active and um, that hurt or that Victoria didn't die in vain. You right. know, that it, and, and my husband said at the funeral to me, he just, you know, whispered in my ear, he says, because of Victoria's death, thousands of lives are going to be saved because we're going to devote the rest of our, our lives to trying, you know, for this to not happen to other parents. Right. That's so wonderful, okay. Jackie. And I'm, I, I was, I was really impressed by that because I know how many times I've had to give Narcan and that was 14 years ago because I've been, I have been away from the ER and ICU for 14 years. And I know that it is quadrupled and quadrupled and quadrupled over the last Wait. 14 years. And, um, that being said, crazy how this is, but you know, I told you my son, um, everybody knows my son had passed away at 17. Well, his father and I were divorced at the time and he actually had remarried and he'd remarried a couple of times, but at the time uh, after, um, when, after Bryant had died, he at the time was married to a lady prior to that. And she had one child, his name was James. James spent the last, I guess, eight years, 10 years going to all the 5k runs. Cause we would raise money in Memphis. Mm -hmm. would give a scholarship to the Bryant kite foundation. And he was there mourning his death. They were very close. And last year, James died of a drug overdose. Oh my God. You know, so, this, yeah. so my daughter, this drug my daughter has had to, uh, she's had to endure the, the death of her brother and her stepbrother. Wow. Yeah. And so okay. at the time when James passed away, my ex had, you know, they had already divorced and he'd married someone else. Um, but we stayed very close. We stayed, yeah. we were very close to James. James thought of me, even though he was my ex's ex stepson, crazy as yeah. that is, sounds kind of Jerry yeah. Springer, but we were very close and he loved my, my husband, Wendell and I, Wendell and I've been together for 21 years and he, he loved us and we loved him because he was so close to my kids. And, you know, anytime you get a divorce and your, and your, your ex remarries, you always want to make sure they're, you know, in a family where if there's another child involved, there's not any craziness. Well, they were very right. close. And yeah. so we were, we in turn were close to him. And so, like I said, for 10 years, I mean, James cried every year when we went through this and, and he just mourned and grieved over Bryant. He loved him so much. And to get that phone call last year that James had died of a drug overdose, which we didn't even know James even did drugs. So right. well, was, what, what, what drug was he on? Or what you know, drug killed him? I, I don't know. I don't know exactly because we, he had been working um, offshore. And so I don't know if he had gotten hooked up with it offshore. I know I later learned that he had not been involved in um, drugs very long. He was in a terrible car accident 
And I believe he ended up getting hooked on prescription drugs. And mm-hmm. when those were not readily available, you know, it turns into other things. So exactly. it turned into a situation where um, I believe that James just got a hold of something. It just, he got a hold of something that was really bad. I mean, all drugs are bad, but now they're laced with all kind of craziness. And it was just a situation where, um, you know, his, his roommate found him and it was horrible wow. because I love his mother so much. It's my ex-husband's ex-wife, but I love her so much. And she lost her only child and the funeral, oh, my, my, she just, she my, latched my. onto my daughter because that was the closest thing she had to a, to a child was, yeah. you know, her stepdaughter, which is no longer her stepdaughter, but it was the closest thing she had. And, you know, I kind of just stepped back and let her have my daughter, you know, for the day yeah. she's yours today because she, she needed yeah. that. And I miss James terribly. You know, we just had his one year mm-hmm. anniversary and he's buried right next to Bryant. Elena you know, and it, uh, right next uh, to him. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. Uh, it's heartbreaking. And, and, and the thing is both, um, your son and your stepson i mean they they probably would have made a big difference in this world you know like my my husband says we're lo- we're losing our future generation i mean it could be the future steve jobs or the future einstein or there's there's um books that we'll never read or songs that right. we'll never hear all these people are 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 just they're dying I know. And I, like I told you, Bryant was, you know, he was such, he, he loved school and he, he had a tremendous amount of group of friends and, you know, he had a 4.2 grade point average in national honor society. I didn't even know when I was in school, that was possible because I was just shooting for the 2.0, you know what I mean? And, (laughs) (laughs) but he, he had that and, you know, he was beautiful. He was most attractive of a senior class, but if you told him he was beautiful, he turned 50 shades of red, you know, he just, (laughs) just, he just is such a sweet soul. And, you know, I sit here in, in my office, in my studio and his picture is right across from me. And so when I'm doing my shows, he gives me strength and, and everything I do, my book that came out in 2014, which was seven years after he died, because I journaled for seven years, wake up call of mother's grief journey, you know, your, your mission and your calling, you're truly making your, your, your mess is truly your message and mission now. And that is to help save lives and bring awareness to the drug epidemic. And it is huge. Parents, your children, make sure you're talking to them. I don't care if it's a breach of their privacy, go through their phones because you could be saving their life. You could not be in the situation that we're in. My son wasn't wearing his seatbelt. And it's hard for me today to believe that that, that he wasn't wearing his seatbelt because that's something he did every single time he was in a car. Mm -hmm. And so why was he not wearing it? Was he taking it off to dig for his cell phone? Was he trying to change the radio or grab his wallet or his phone? I don't know what he was doing. It doesn't matter. He's not here, but the fact being, he wasn't wearing his seatbelt. And my mission in life is to be there for grieving moms. I want to be there to bring joy and life back to the mom who felt, felt like that they lost part of their heart, which they did. We just have to learn how to continue to go on with a piece of our heart missing because it will forever be gone. Well, I, I tell you, um, if anything else, you're giving me like so much um, strength right now. Because um, people, have, people that have lost, like have been coming to me looking for strength. And I'm not like a real strong person, but um, talking to people like you, is giving me strength and um those words of encouragement and i think it's i really really think we should get together when when we finish versailles to do like a a retreat like um yes you said like a spiritual um mother yes um, retreat oh i can see i can see it and you know what we will do jackie we will have crowns because all these mothers deserve to be treated like queens Um, If you're suffering the grief of burying your child, of actually watching your child in a coffin and saying goodbye to them, which was, I don't know which was harder, getting the phone call or or being there and not wanting to walk away because they told me it was time to go. And I didn't want to leave. I wanted to actually be buried with him that day. As morbid as that sounds, 
that those thoughts yeah. actually go through your head that you just want to go. You just want to go right that day. I know there were, there are times in the middle of the night where I wanted just to go get a blanket and go sleep on top of her grave. And I, I, I used to always be afraid of the graveyards, but knowing that she's there, I'm not scared. You know, I just felt like it's a, a peace with her, you know? I am and, the same um, way. I've thought of that myself. Okay, see, this is why we have to get together because I have these thoughts and I think they're crazy until I hear somebody tell me a thought that I actually had. Oh my God. I, I even have like a little a bench in my backyard, um, her, an engraving of her picture on it that I, that I go and I sit and, and I feel that she's there. If we have a butterfly garden. I feel like when a butterfly lands on me that that's her spirit um. telling me that she's there. You're going to yeah. do, and, you You and your husband are doing so much, Jackie, to, to help bring awareness and also be there for moms, other moms. So your, your mission is actually double fold, right? Because it is, yeah. you're, you're bringing awareness to the drug epidemic, but you're also being an, an open heart to a mother that that's grieving, which is what my calling is. And that is just yeah. any adversity. You know, the, my last book, strong women was about going through any adversity because one thing that I learned and you and I had not talked about this was grief comes in a lot of different forms. It's not just the grief of a loss, right? People get divorced. Right. They lose their identities. They go bankrupt. They lose all of their right. money, their businesses, and they grieve because they don't know what else to do. So as right. in my speaking, I was actually speaking to someone that had lost their father. And at the time I had not lost my dad. I just lost my dad in July of last year, but at the time oh, I had boy. not lost my dad. And so I couldn't really relate to him losing his mm -hmm. dad. And I thought, mm -hmm. you know what, if I'm going to speak, I have to speak from education, not just experience. So I yeah. went back to school online and enrolled in a course just for nurses and physicians and got my certification in grief coaching. And I what? did that to speak from experience and education. And so I have the resource and the education as well as the experience now that's given me confidence to be able to be that healing person for somebody else. So for you to tell me that I've helped you today, just you conf have. confirms confirms my mission that that's all I want to be able to do. Yeah, you know, and and uh, you know, I've also um, learned like at, at funerals, like um, that people like they shouldn't say unless they've been through the same loss, if they've lost lost a father or something, you know, not to say I know how you feel oh, because gosh. they really don't unless they have experienced that loss. And unfortunately, when other people tell me that they lost their child, that unfortunately, I, I can actually say, I know how you feel now right. because I can. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I did a blog post. I'm going to have to repost it on my website. And it was 10 things to never say to a grieving mom. And that was on the list. Unless wow. you've been, <laughs> been in that. I'm going to have to repost that. I'm unless, glad that you remind me of that. You're, unless you're in the club that we don't want to be in, you know, exactly. we're there by, by proxy. Is that what it is? Exactly. Is you are absolutely right. Well, Jackie, I know you have places to go and you have things to do today and I'm going to let you go, but I'm, I'm really, I want you to tell us a little bit about the foundation too, before we go, tell us about the foundation and how anyone can help or get involved with the foundation. Okay. Well, our, our foundation is uh, Victoria's, um, voice foundation um but what it is is actually uh, it's about educating people about the drug epidemic and about narcan and we actually use the money to provide the the narcan for different facilities that, that need it that's like the, the main thing of the foundation and um but anyone can get to our websites i've tried to make it very easy between my website and um, the foundation just to go to the real queen of com, and you have to have the word the in there the real right. queen of com. but that's the real queen of Versailles is also my instagram okay my facebook and my twitter so everything is just the queen of Versailles. perfect and then and victoria's voice we can find that where all can we get that book so they can get the book um on Amazon or at Barnes and Noble. 
So we're already, we're already on our second printing and it's only been a month since we released the book. Wow. Well, is that crazy? The book is powerful. And before we leave, I'm going to tell you guys, if, if you, if, if you're a parent, I'm not even going to say what age your child is because I don't even think there's an age anymore. It doesn't matter. The children of all ages are getting involved in drugs because they're being introduced to it at their school. They're being introduced to it in their neighborhoods and communities. And just like Victoria, she goes to get help. She really wants help and she goes to a drug rehab. And then we have a, a someone there that is, you know, eight years older than she is, uh, nine years older than she is, that's introducing her to a drug that she hadn't even tried before, which ultimately uh, took her life four weeks later. So the drugs are there, parents. The drugs are there. So don't be naive to it. Talk to your children. Um, make sure that you follow Victoria, the real queen of her side.com. Her book, Victoria's Voice. I'm halfway finished and I'm going to finish this book and I'm going to give this book away. So if you're hearing the podcast today and you want a free copy of Victoria's Voice, go on Jackie and I's promotional ad post today on Instagram and tell me you heard the show and you want the book. And the first person that does that, I'm going to send Victoria's voice to you. Thank you so much, Jackie. I appreciate you so much being on the show. Thank you. And, and um, God bless you and, and all the parents out there. I'm, I'm happy you. to help. Thank you. And guys, remember, as always, keep your inspirational tank full. Keep your faith in God. Step out of your comfort zone and try something that you've never tried before. Have a blessed week.